Okay, so although this is an online event, um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Indigenous lands that I am joining you all from here in Canada. I am joining this conversation on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, and I would like to acknowledge the long-standing presence of Indigenous peoples in this territory. I would like to also invite everyone to acknowledge the Indigenous lands that you are joining from in the chat box. If you are not sure, we have shared uh, or will soon share in the chat a link to a resource called Whose Land That Might Help. We are taking the time to acknowledge this, not only because non-Indigenous Canadians, including myself, need to integrate this knowledge into our everyday lives, but also to highlight that experiences of displacement, which we will be talking about today, are also something that have happened and continue to happen here in Canada. Today, we are joined by the co-editors and three outstanding authors of the new book, Deadly Voyages, Migrant Journeys Across the Globe. Deadly Voyages was edited by Dr. Veronica Finbrui, an assistant professor in the Department of Legal Studies at Athabasca University, and Professor Stephen Bender, the Associate Dean for Planning and Strategic Initiatives and Professor of Law at the Seattle University School of Law. Our authors today are Dr. Kate Ogg, Associate Professor with the School of Law at the Australian National University, who has kindly stayed up very late to join us today. We are also joined by Mohamed Amin, PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Ottawa, and by Dr. Sasha Begley, an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ontario Tech University. We are also joined by Rachel Nyandeng Aye, who is a student at the University of Toronto, entering into her final year with a double major in political science and criminology, law, and society. I won't read their full biographies, but I do encourage you, if you haven't already, to visit our website through the link in the chat for more information about the wonderful accomplishments of today's guests. We are always so keen to hear from leading academics about the latest research on global development and forced displacement and from those with lived experiences by sharing their learnings and reflections with organizations like WUSC and with all of us, we are able to collectively drive greater positive impact by grounding our programming in actionable information and evidence. But today's book launch is extra special for WUSC because one of the co-editors, Veronica, also happens to be an alum of our student refugee program. Veronica, we are so thrilled to welcome you back here today, and we were so honored when you first approached us with the idea to help launch this important resource with our network. And important it is. Deadly Voyages explores the burdens and impact of perilous migration while considering which laws, policies, practices, and venues might establish empathy and protection for migrants. According to the latest figures from UNHCR, more than 79 million people are forcibly displaced worldwide, a figure that continues to rise every year and which now represents 1% of the global population. 40% of those displaced are under the age of 18. In 2019, an estimated 11 million people were newly displaced, many of whom undertook dangerous and life-threatening journeys in pursuit of safety and greater prosperity. These statistics, representing millions of individuals, call for urgent and transformative action. The need has never been greater for the book that we will be discussing today. So to tell you more about it, I would like to invite Veronica and Stephen, the book's co-editors, to say a few words. Hi, Stephanie, can we have the slides on, please? Just setting it up here. Be on in one right. second. Okay, thank you, Stephanie, and everybody at WUSC, my WUSC family, for giving me this special opportunity to share some of the work that I have been doing in the last two decades since I entered Canada as a refugee sponsored student at the University of British Columbia 
it is an honor and it's uh, always a blessing to come back home to Wusk. Uh, Wusk is my family. Wusk, I will always remember in my heart. And I am so glad that after two decades, I'm still connected with Wusk and I still get that kind of support that I, I get from Wusk. Before I um, continue with giving you a brief overview, overview of the book, first of all, I would like to just acknowledge and say thank you to my fellow um, contributors and authors. Uh, thank you so much for helping us put this book together and making it what it is today and to promote it and to continue to uh, and to continue with the discussion on deadly voyages around the globe. I would also like to say a big thank you to Emily Roderick and all the folks at Lexington Press who made this possible. Um, and of course, um, to all of you for taking the time and, and giving the support that we so desire and so need for our work to continue. So thank you for being a part of this conversation. And I'm really hoping that you will have the chance to ask us more questions during the Q&A. All right, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so I'm just going to give you about five minutes of an overview. So it's not in detail. Hopefully, uh, when you get the opportunity to buy the book or when you listen to our three authors that will be presenting and, and, and including Professor Bender contribution as well, you will have a little bit more insight about what the book is uh, all about. But I will just give you a brief synopsis, just an overview so that you have some context, you have some background. So when uh, presenters are giving their talks, you will, you will not be lost. So by the time I'm done with this five minute presentation, I would have introduced our uh, the editors most likely. And I will give you a brief background, tell you about the image that we have on the book cover. And of course, those we dedicated the book to, the book layout, which, give you um, some level of, of, of all the chapters and what is what they're about. And I will read you three of the six conclusions. Um, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Professor Bender to add a bit more on the book overview. Next slide, please. Um, Stephanie has already introduced Professor Bender, but I always like to take this opportunity to honor him. Uh, Professor Bender is my mentor. I met Professor Bender in 2017 while I was, uh, I had just finished with my PhD, I submitted my dissertation and I'm in Seattle here wondering what to do next after the PhD and I got in contact with Seattle University School of Law and I was hired as an adjunct professor. And the first person everybody told me to connect with was Professor Bender. And ever since 2017, I've never regretted. He's one of a kind, he's very unique, and he literally took me under his wings and has given me all the support that I need to thrive in a law school that is very male and very white and very um, masculine. <laughs> so. Um, I always like to take the honor and the opportunity to say thank you to him for nurturing me and continuing to continuing to support me and give me a sense of direction to help me progress in my academic career. Thank you, Professor Bender. Next slide, please. So um, as you may be aware, because I'm sure all of you on this uh, on this lunch uh, are aware of the global migration issues and the problems we face is not a new story. We've always migrated as humans. But for us, for me personally as well, the context of this book is very much grounded in that uh, inhumane migration, uh, precisely the transatlantic slave trade and uh, boat people that are continuously being stigmatized and stereotypes that are headed to Australia from the Middle East and from um, mostly Southeast Asia. And we also recently had the Syrian refugees massing at the frontiers of Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and, and Egypt. And now we also have, and this has been going on for a long time. It's not even just now, on a company of minors. Just yesterday, I was reading a story about a 10 year old that was reunited with uh, his mother at the US border. Uh, 
Um, so the Northern Triangle El Salvador in Guatemala and Honduras, uh, this uh, treacherous journeys have been going on for, for, for years, for decades. We also have migrants from Africa that are braving the perilous journeys from across uh, the continent to uh, the Mediterranean to enter Europe. So these are some of the um, terrible, horrible uh, human migration that is involved in the discussion of this book that we encourage you to, to get a copy. Next slide, please. So I only have the cover of the book here because um, of our image. We were very fortunate to have one of our contributor, one of our authors to this volume um, do this book design for us. She, she is an artist as well as an academic and that's Ner Nergis uh, Kennedy from uh, Osgood. She got a PhD at Osgood. I think she's still at the Center for Refugee Studies at uh, York University. So I wanna acknowledge her and say thank you um, for you know signifying and representing what um, De deadly voyage actually is. So you can see it's a boat full of people and somebody reaching out their hand to assist. And uh, Professor Benner, did she actually did several uh, images, but we chose this particular one because we felt it represented that form of uh, compassionate migration. Next slide, please. So I would like to... Um, I dedicate this book, I, well, no, I would like to, we actually dedicated this book to migrants everywhere in need of compassion, dignity, and respect, who, whose persistence, resilience, and dare to survive predispose them to incomprehensible perils. We honor the lives of those that have, that have been lost during the deadly voyages. So it was just um, automatic and organic that we did that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> so yes, uh, we have a total of 15 chapters and I'm just going to run over the chapters quickly so that you have a teaser as to what are some of the issues we are dealing with. Chapter one specifically deal with learning to look Mexican, Central American minor migrants and their strategies to minimize the risk of migration was done by Angel Garcia. He is a, a PhD student at Northwestern university here in the US. The next chapter was done by responding, was, uh, is responding to the back wave, the migrant crisis and the Gambia, which is done by a uh, co-author by uh, Nicholas Hot Halting and Francisca Zanker. Chapter three is um, voyaging into the unknown as migrants and trafficked women and girls traveling from Kenya to Ashabab war, war front in Somalia. This chapter was done by Fatima Amiza Bradodane. I always get her name wrong. She is a professor in Kenya. Next slide, please. And chapter four was done by Maya, who is currently doing her PhD at Queen Mary University, uh, one of the conglomerates of University of London in England. Uh, her chapter is on refugee status for survivors of dangerous journeys, establishing nexus to nationality. And we have chapter five, our wonderful Mohammed, who will be presenting to you today. He, his chapter, he will tell you more details, but his chapter is uh, Refugee Narratives and Lived Experiences, Deconstructing Negative Act. Ac attitudes within the European public, public sphere. And the next chapter is by my wonderful friend, Kid. Kid and I went to, um, Kid was teaching at uh, Australian National University when I was doing my PhD and Kid and I bonded when I was in Australia, a wonderful human being, just a good person. And she's more or less a sister to me. So I'm so glad to have her chapter in this book. And I'm so glad she making extra time in Australia to be up like 1 a.m. in the morning to contribute to this book launch. So Kit's chapter is on uh, Destination Australia, Journeys of the Moribund. Next slide, please. And chapter seven deals with uh, deadly voyages after death and is by Ariana Jacquemin. Ariana is based in Italy. 
And of course, Professor Bender's chapter, uh, chapter eight is Deadly Deportations, a Perspective from the Americas. Next, please. Chapter nine uh, deals with climate related displacements in the age of the Anthropocene. Of course, it's Nergis who did the cover of the book and Azin Imami, as Azin is currently working with uh, the AOM, but she's also based in Toronto. Um, and then Chen Yu Liu deals with disaster displacement in humanitarian development context. Michael Adeni, who is a professor in the university, in a university up north in Ghana. His chapter deals with uh, managing cross-border climate-induced migration in the African Union, legal implications and policy interventions. Next slide, please. Um, Tarini Minta is an associate professor of uh, Jintai University in India. She deals with environmental refugees from Bangladesh avenues for refuge in India. And of course, myself, I dealt with uh, deadly voyages of African migrants crossing the Mediterranean, and I looked at the African Union and the European Union law and policy response. The last two chapter, um, Fake Reduces, uh, Amir Hazion is an Ethiopian. His chapter is on short-sighted solutions and examination of Europe's response to the Mediterranean migration crisis. And our wonderful Sasha Bagley, Sasha was also at, at Osgood when I think she had just finished, uh, but I heard so much about Sasha when I entered Osgood her to do my uh, LLM. So I know Sasha from that from long ago. But then when we're writing a book, Professor Bender said, oh, I met this lady at the conference and her name is Sasha Bagley. I was like, I know her. <laughs> so um, thank you, Sasha. And uh, Sasha's chapter is on Canada's response to recent cross borders arrivals from the United States. What's in the message? So she will also be presenting. All right, finally. So um, the, the book has many, many recommendations and we concluded uh, with some pointers, but I just go in for the sake of time, I'm just going to read out the first three uh, conclusions that the book came out to, and then I will turn over to Professor Bender. This book's publication coincides with the urgency of an increasing number of displaced populations due to violent conflicts, insecurity, natural disasters, and climate change. The interdisciplinary book calls for a transformation in migration policy with drastic reduction in apparel migrants across the globe uh, faced when compelled to make treacherous journeys. Finally, the book seeks to inform, educate, persuade, and facilitate newer or less hard perspectives towards wider participation and influence within the forced migration and development policy debate. So I will keep quiet and now I'm turning it over to Professor Bender. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Veronica. Um, I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna mention a few things the book is notable for and then turn to our presenters. Um, so the book um, is, is, is notable in particular because um, its editor uh, who you just heard from uh, Veronica was a boat person herself. Um, she was a refugee who survived a traumatic and dangerous boat journey on the African coast um, as a child. Um, and it's very unusual for an academic writing in the field to have their own, in this case, her own story of survival. Um, and it launched the volume. Um, the book also has an emphasis on global migration. You heard about each of the chapters. Um, we have um, Africa um, to Europe migration, um, discussed Asian uh, migration. We have three chapters on the Americas, including Sasha uh, Bagley's on, on Canada, and we have um, chapters on Australia as well, including one that you'll hear from today. We have an emphasis on the causes of migration, not just the deadly and dangerous fact of migration, but the causes, particularly climate change and disaster, which is increasingly um, relevant for the Americas that continue to suffer devastating hurricanes and other climate events. Um, most important, we have an emphasis on solutions, on mitigating the deadly dangerous consequences 
of, of migrant journeys. On a day that from the United States, Vice President Kamala Harris is in Guatemala trying to address some of the causes uh, of Northern Triangle immigration or migration to the Americas. Um, so my thanks to Veronica for her vision um, and her survival, um, to our contributing authors for their insights and to, your, and to the audience, all of you for your attention to the migrant plight. So I look forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers. Thank you so much, both of you, for this really great overview. Um, I must admit that I am still anxiously awaiting my copy of the book, so I am, I'm really excited to get this overview uh, alongside all of you today. Um, if anyone is interested in getting a copy, of course, we encourage you to uh, visit your, your local bookstore. Um, but I also wanted to let you all know that we are running a contest over on our Instagram page right now. More information um, is being dropped into the chat box below. Um, and uh, you can head over there to um, enter to win a copy uh, it closes tomorrow. Um, so uh, as you know, today we are going to be talking more about the theme of refugee narratives, which I know is a topic that is very near and dear to many of the attendees today. So we really do encourage your comments and reflections in the chat box um, and your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentations. And to start this discussion, I would like to invite Dr. Kate Ogg to present an overview of the findings from her chapter, Destination Australia, Journeys of the Moribound. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's been an absolute honour to work uh, with Veronica. It's a privilege to present today to a WUSC audience. I think the work that WUSC does is amazing. I have attempted with various organisations in Australia to try and replicate the WUSC model uh, down under. Have not had much success yet, but we will keep trying. So hopefully one day. Um, so Veronica asked me uh, to be part of this project to um, present an Australian perspective on uh, dangerous voyages of refugees and migrants. So I, my research for the chapter does have an Australian focus, but at the end of the presentation, I'm going to um, open up and talk about some of the parallels in particular between Australia and Canada uh, that give rise to, I think, some really new, rich, interesting, important um, topics for uh, research. Um, so next slide. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so the, um, the theoretical inroad um, is Michael Collier's uh, work on uh, refugee journeys. And he makes this point in this article that you know, refugee journeys are rarely linear. Uh, they're often fragmented. So the focus for my chapter looks at the very end, the last leg of what is often incredibly long fragmented journey uh, refugees make to Australia. And, and that is to give a bit of background, Australia has what's called the Pacific Solution. Uh, so Australia sends refugees to Nauru and Papua New Guinea. And I'm looking at the legal grounds uh, available to refugees um, to transfer from offshore processing back to Australia. So how do they make that last leg of the fragmented journey? What are the legal grounds on which they can do so? My um, findings are that those, those legal grounds um, for transfer have really atrophied. Australia has gone from having the highest protection standards in the world um, to transfers very much becoming medicalized. And to trigger these legal frameworks, refugees have to be, you know, in extremist moribund, uh, you know, next to death almost. And as a result of that, when they come to Australia, you know, from offshore processing facilities, they don't come as human beings, as bearers of human rights. They're really coming as sick patients in need of medical care. While this undoubtedly, um, you know, makes really, you know, is very meaningful for individual refugees. I think um, the problem is, is that it does a disservice to those greater goals, the greater goals Veronica talked about, about how do we get more empathetic uh, laws and policies. Next slide. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I'm looking at um, my chapter looks at legislative reform. So legislative reform we've had post um, the reintroduction of offshore processing, looking at the narratives used by our parliamentarians. 
but I'm also looking at strategic litigation. So the types of litigation uh, asylum seekers and refugees have bought to challenge offshore processing and to seek a transfer um, to Australia or to resist a transfer to um, a, a nearby country as, as part of offshore processing. Next slide, thanks. Um, so uh, Pickering and Weber did a discourse analysis um, of parliamentary debate when in, uh, re, um, offshore processing was reintroduced in 2012. And their findings was that most Australian parliamentarians were using what they call a deterrent script, but some were using what they called an ethic of care script. script. And human rights was part of that ethic of care script. So human rights was part of the parliamentary debate, but it was certainly peripheral. Since the reintroduction of offshore processing, we've had two unsuccessful bills. Um, the first one in particular, 2014, ending the nation's shame was very much grounded in human rights, international law, refugee rights, uh, are unsuccessful. Um, the, the only successful legislative reform we've had um, to give greater frameworks for refugees to be able to come from Nauru and Papua New Guinea to Australia is the Migration Amendment Urgent Medical Treatment Bill 2018. Um, so this bill was passed both the um, uh, House of Representatives and the Senate and it became law. Next slide, thanks, um, Stephanie. Uh, but what you, I did a discourse analysis of the of the um, parliamentary debates in the Senate and the House of Reps, and and what you'll see is that there's this fixation on medical care, on the body, um, on on healthcare, and um, uh, there's not pretty much no reference to human rights or refugee rights at all. Um, next slide. I've got um, to. Um, to pass, um, to pass uh, and become law, um, the bill had to get the support of a number of the crossbenchers. And you can see here, I've got the Senator Hinch and Senator Story quotes from them. Um, you can see, and Senator Hinch literally said, what has swayed me um, is, is the medical aspects of Nauru and Manus that have swayed me. Um, all of these parliamentarians talk about a medical crisis on Nauru and Manus Island. And if you read these parliamentary debates without context, you would honestly think that there had been a case of Ebola on Nauru or some horrific uh, natural disaster. There's no understanding or no acknowledgement on behalf of our members of parliament that Australia has created this, what is being called a medical crisis, um, you know, by setting up offshore processing, you know, underfunding it um, and, and not, you know, allowing people to have access to, um, you know, much more than medical care, you know, education, for example, um, hope for the future in, in offshore processing facilities. So essentially my conclusion about the legislative reform is that human rights have transitioned in the Australian parliament from peripheral to entirely absent. Now this bill that did become law was law for about nine months and it was repealed uh, when our conservative liberal government um, won the election in, in 2019. So it's, um, uh, you know, so it's, it's no longer um, law in Australia. Uh, next slide, thanks, Stephanie. But alongside this, um, so alongside legislative reform um, that was only temporarily successful, asylum seekers and refugees have been coming to courts in Australia, Papua New Guinea, Nauru, pleading many different um, legal arguments to try and resist being sent from Australia to an offshore processing facility or trying to transfer from Nauru or Papua New Guinea to Australia. The first case um, was successful. That was the case of Plaintiff M70, the first case reference there for you. Um, in uh, this case, it was about an uh, asylum seekers um, resisting being transferred from Australia to Malaysia. So Australia had entered into an agreement with Malaysia to send asylum seekers there. Um, the High Court of Australia refocused on this word protection in our Migration Act and said protection means all of the rights in the Refugee Convention in law and practice, Malaysia does not reach that standard and therefore this, the agreement between Australia and Malaysia was invalid. That decision, plaintiff 
FM70 set the highest threshold for effective protection of any court decision anywhere in the world. So globally, it's a really significant case. Unfortunately, in Australia, its significance is diminished because the uh, parliament took that word protection out of the Migration Act um, and said that uh, the Minister for Immigration can declare um, another country to be you know, available for offshore processing if it's in the national interest. And if you have a look at the case Plaintiff 156, this was bought by an asylum seeker in Papua New Guinea trying to um, argue against the validity of Australia's agreement with Papua New Guinea, um, you know, saying, you know, the, the court had to take into account international law, Papua New Guinean law and practice, the court sort of really um, uh, was read as the court said, no, the only question is whether this was in the national interest. This is a political decision. So the court essentially washed its hands um, of the matter and the case was unsuccessful. Plaintiff M68 was a constitutional law case, so that was about protections against detention in the Australian Constitution and the Nauru Constitution. I mean, ultimately, it was really about um, challenging the validity of Australia's agreement with Nauru. It was unsuccessful. Um, there's a wonderful case from the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea, Belden Norman Nama, where the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea held that the Manus Island Detention Centre was uh, in violation of the um, constitutional right in Papua New Guinea to liberty. Uh, but um, to for the, the asylum seekers and refugees bringing that case, their ultimate aim was to be transferred to Australia. They attempted that um, and the only way they could do that was subsequent um, successful litigation in Australia. They attempted that in the case of plaintiff S195. They tried to argue, well, the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea has said that, you know, the Manus Detention Centre is illegal. Um, and the High Court of Australia just said, well, we, you know, we're not bound. We're not bound to consider anything um, that the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea um, has had to say. So in a nutshell, there is no longer any international law, human rights law, constitutional law or public law grounds on which asylum seekers and refugees can come to courts in Australia and argue um, to, to make that final leg of the journey come from Nauru or Papua New Guinea to Australia or resist being transferred from Australia to Nauru or Papua New Guinea. Last slide, oh no, next slide, I'll, I'll try and finish up very soon. There is, however, a ground in tort law. Um, so asylum seekers can use tort law um, to um, petition for an urgent transfer only for medical, urgent medical attention. The grotesque epitomization of law in Australia protecting the body and only the body, I think, comes through in the case of DCQ 18 and the transcript. The transcript shows in open court um, a number of um, male um, lawyers arguing about the size of the, uh, the opening of an asylum seeker's vagina. And that was the determinative factor as to whether this woman would get a transfer um, out of Nauru to a place where she could seek the medical treatment that she needed. Uh, next, next slide, and this is the last slide, I promise. So look, um, issues for research and in particular to Canada. Um, so over a hundred asylum seekers and refugees in Nauru and Papua New Guinea have been transferred not to Australia, but to Canada through what I think can only be described as transnational community sponsorship. Australians have raised the money. They've given the money to Canadians. Canadians have um, formally sponsored them through Canadian programs, sponsorship programs, and they've gone to Canada. So that idea of transnational community sponsorship, I don't think, I mean, I think it's such a rich, important topic for research. It's a PhD just waiting to be written. And I'm just waiting for someone to take that up. Um, the other connection between Australia and Canada is I think we've got to be really concerned about the lack of just disability or protection elsewhere agreement. So I've spoken about how essentially courts in Australia will not entertain any challenge to offshore processing. I think Canadians have to be very, very concerned about the Federal Court of Appeal decision handed down in April this year about the US-Canada Safe Third Country Agreement. Uh, the court indicated what would be needed for a successful challenge to that agreement. 
um, and that what they indicated just set the evidentiary bar so high, I think impossibly high. Um, so I think you've really got to wonder whether there, you know, any any future uh, challenge to that agreement is going to be justiciable. Um, I've got also got a reference to a, a sort of parallel decision in Europe, um, which I can talk about if anyone has questions, but um, I, I am definitely expired. I've gone over the time. So thank you, Stephanie, for being generous. Thank you so much, Kate, for um, that great presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning, Kate uh, has been so generous to join us from Australia, where there's quite the time difference. Um, so we would like to invite her just to say goodbye for now uh, and go and get some rest. But if you do have questions for Kate, um, we still encourage you throughout the presentation to leave them in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll see if we can follow up with Kate later um, and get some of those answered for you out on our social media channels. Um, so thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Next, I would like to invite Mohammed to present his chapter, Refugee Narratives and Lived Experiences, Deconstructing Negative Attitudes Within the European Public Sphere. Perfect. <clears throat> thank you. So first off, I just wanna thank you for welcoming me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all and uh, kudos for uh, all the work that went into the preparation for, uh, for this uh, event. And um, just very quickly, I wanna take this opportunity as well to um, acknowledge all the other contributors to the book. Um, I'm really proud of you all, so kudos. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Brewey and Dr. Bender for uh, giving me the opportunity to share um, my work and my research in the book and for all their effort and tireless work in making the project become a reality. So hats off to them, they deserve a lot of credit. So if you'll allow me, I just wanna start off with a story, if that's okay. Um, I've been fascinated by storytelling my entire life. And uh, so I just wanna kind of delve into that for, for a moment. So, and I think the story will give you a bit of context as to what my chapter is about. So in 1948, there was a young 20 year old aristocrat who fled his home in Hungary. And the reason he did so was to escape, um, you know, escape the army and escape forced labor at the hands of the occupying Soviet forces. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he found refuge in Germany near, um, near the French border. And it was there where he was recruited by the French Foreign Legion. And although he was expected to be sent to the front lines to fight in the Indochina war, uh, his life was actually spared when he was medically discharged by a very sympathetic army doctor who just so happened to be, he was also of Hungarian descent. And the reason he did so is because the French forces at the time were encountering very heavy losses and they were on the verge of defeat. So after his release, uh, he settled in Paris uh, where he found himself quite destitute and homeless he was sleeping on the streets of, uh, of Paris. Um, and this went on for some time before he eventually landed uh, an entry level job in a film company. <clears throat> so he remained in France illegally. Uh, he was stateless. He had no official documents. And it was only later on where he formally applied for French citizenship uh, in the 1970s. So he eventually became a prominent advertising designer. He achieved financial success. Um, so the story had a happy ending. So why then am I telling you about this particular story, you know, compared to millions of others uh, of its kind at the time? So the reason is because that man, uh, his name is Paul Sarkozy. And you might recognize the last name because he's the father of the former French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, himself the offspring of refugee parents. So the story is filled with a lot of irony, given that the younger Sarkozy, you know, his well-known attitudes towards foreigners in general, but particularly refugees and asylum seekers. So during the French um, suburb riots, uh, Les Émeutes uh, des Banlieues in 2005, uh, the younger Sarkozy, who was Minister of Interior at the time, uh, he was accused of, you know, um, you know he accused the, the second generation youth um, who were from immigrant parents for being the root cause of a lot of the, the violence, the unrest. And he used this language that, that was quite um, disparaging and offensive. You know, he, he labeled them as being the scum, uh, the thugs of, of French society who were plaguing, uh, plaguing you know, the, 
the, the French communities and, and, and so on. But many, many people who identified with Sarkozy's discourse and accused foreigners in the same light of perpetuating violence, you know, stealing jobs, abusing the welfare system, uh, threatening the very fabric of the French nation, the, la, la nation française. Um, you know, there were media headlines that demonized migrants in France, um, and those those headlines dominated a lot of you know the public sphere and, and perpetuated this kind of like this debate about refugees that was very heavily one sided. So it, it should be noted that uh, it was predominantly controlled uh, by leading and authoritative actors, so politicians, policymakers, you know, the mainstream media. Uh, you know, there was uh, you know lobby groups you know, uh, political parties, et cetera. And so they seized ownership of this public space in which the debate about refugees materialized. So in turn, it resulted in the creation of a very negative and hostile narrative about refugees in Europe. Um, you know, one that's been very widely documented and basically accepted as mainstream. So I use France as an example in this case uh, and speaking to you now, but you can look at any other country in Europe and witness you know, the same types of narratives, the same types of occurrences um, that, have, that have happened. And to a greater ex extent, it also applies to a wider European public sphere as well. <clears throat> so <clears throat> migrants who are portrayed in such a negative light are rarely, if ever, afforded any kind of you know, legitimate space within this wider European public sphere to either influence or contribute to the refugee debate. So all that to be said that the chapter in the book that I, that I contributed, um, which is derived from my PhD research, is a compilation of stories that looks at how these individual experiences provide, you know, what I call an alternative perspective and a different voice to what's been traditionally a very one-sided and polarizing debate. So essentially I have two main objectives. Um, you know, the, the first is basically that these personal stories help deconstruct a lot of the negative attitudes about refugees, their experiences, how they fit into what's become a more you know, diverse Europe, if you will. Um, and it's through these narratives that not only are we better able to recognize and appreciate the value of such experiences and what they represent, but they also help introduce refugees as you know, legitimate and contributing actors within the public sphere. And it reinforces more inclusive, like more of an inclusive membership within this debate. So as part of my, uh, as part of my research, um, uh, which spent uh, four months, uh, no, sorry, five months, uh, I did field research. Um, I, I travel all across Europe. I was in refugee camps, um, you know, organizations. I, I, I found a lot of people to talk to. Um, and I asked participants a, a vast array of questions, but for the sake of the chapter, uh, I tried to capture uh, a picture of what I call the before, the during, and the after. So, you know, one of the first questions I asked is, how did they become refugees? Why did they leave? What were the circumstances? So a few examples uh, in the chapter, um, for instance, uh, for the sake of, of pseudonyms and, and, and to protect their names and their identities. Uh, I look at Charlie, for instance, who worked as a translator uh, for the American forces in Afghanistan. You know, he was threatened by the Taliban. His family was threatened because, you know, he was working basically as a translator. Um, he had to leave, you know, in Katarina's case, uh, her involvement during the Bosnian war and the ensuing outspokenness, um, you know, against the government, against the Bosnian government, who on that side she fought for, um, you know, force her to leave for political persecution. So those are some of the examples. Um, you know, I, I looked at their travel and their journey in reaching their destination. So what were the conditions of the voyage? Did they use smugglers, for instance? If yes, what was that experience like? And so there's a few responses that stand out. Um, one of the individuals I spoke to, Nozad, um, was actually lied to by smugglers since, you know, he was told that the voyage was only supposed to take three days, but it took nearly a week and they ran out of food and water after four days. Um, you know, when they actually got near the coast of Italy, they were approached by a small motorboat with men who were armed and forced them at gunpoint to load these wooden crates uh, onto their boat. And so, you know, it was kind of anecdotal, but, you know, had a serious tone to it as well. You know, he assumed they were drugs, right? Um, in Hamid's case, you know, his smugglers were so utterly incompetent that they actually got lost on the way on several occasions trying to get into Bulgaria. 
Um, but you know, there's other cases as well where, for instance, like Ida and Charlie, um, they basically got on a plane, landed at their destination country and simply requested asylum. And so it was pretty straightforward. So you see a little bit the contrast in, in the experiences. Um, and then finally, what was their experience like upon arrival? So how were they received? How were they treated by local authorities? Were they put in reception camps? Were they detained at all? Um, if so, what were the conditions in the detention center? So one of the examples that, that comes to mind is, uh, you know, in Cuthbert's case, uh, he was detained at Sandholm Detention Center in Copenhagen, Denmark. So for him, it was akin to being, you know, in a zoo where detainees were treated like animals in, in which your day consisted of sleep, eat, and what he described, toilet. Um, you know, in his view, since he was under constant surveillance and kept against his will, he considered himself to be, you know, sort of like a, a criminal in jail. Um, but there are other instances as well, you know, in which the conditions were not as bad. So you can kind of see the contrast. So I used oral history interviewing to examine the lived experiences of refugees for a number of reasons. Um, you know, personal testimonies allow us to better identify with people. You know, it emphasizes the importance of the individual as the primary subject of analysis. Um, you know, these narratives directly shape and fill considerable gaps within the mainstream refugee discourse in Europe um, because migrants are the sole authority on their knowledge. And, you know, they exercise considerable control over the content of their stories. Uh, and third, they enable participants being studied the ability to tell their own stories in their own words, which can be highly beneficial. And, you know, what I experienced speaking to them is very empowering. So just to conclude, um, when you begin to deconstruct many of the nuances that differentiate individual experiences from one another, it does become quickly apparent that not all refugee stories are alike, nor should they be characterized by, you know, these sweeping generalizations that paint a common picture of the asylum experience. You know, their impact on the, ref on the European refugee discourse is that they provide an alternative voice to this debate, which comes directly from refugees and asylum seekers themselves. And just lastly, uh, their inclusion as new and legitimate actors within this European public sphere, what it does is that it helps contribute to the evolving nature of asylum as a topic of inquiry and one that continues to be discussed and debated today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, I would now like to invite Sasha to share with us a presentation on her chapter, Canada's response to 2017-18 cross-border arrivals from the US, what's in the message? And just bear with me while I get the presentation back up in just a second. Thank you. Hello, everybody. While you're setting up the slides, uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel and a part of this book. So once again, Thank you, Stephen and Veronica, for making me a part of this project. Um, I think my presentation connects actually and resonates very well with the themes that have been highlighted by the previous two speakers. So we'll really see sort of, I think, very, very nicely connected presentations around different types of discourses. Um, my presentation will look particularly at the discourse employed by the Canadian government in relation to the increase in um, arrivals of refugee claimants from the US to Canada, in particular that we've seen in 2017-18. I think we can move to the next slide. Um, especially those of you who are in Canada are probably familiar with the context, but I will mention a couple of basic things. So first of all, um, after the arrival of the Trump administration, we have seen a significant increase in arrivals of asylum seekers from the US to Canada. Um, they were coming from a range of different countries, uh, actually some about 120 different countries, but among the top countries were uh, Haiti and Nigeria, especially in 2017. 2018, Nigeria was actually the top um, country of origin of those asylum seekers. Can we actually move to the next slide for a second? And why the increase in arrivals has actually attracted so much attention because it was, at least by Canadian standards, quite significant. So here you can see the sort of the stats over the last 20 years, and you don't definitely notice a significant increase from 2017 onwards. And cross-border arrivals accounted for about 36 to 38 percent of those arrivals. So this is something that was definitely noticeable, attracted quite a lot of attention, both in the media and in parliamentary debates. 
Um, another reason why the arrivals have attracted a lot of attention is because they were not, if you will, evenly distributed across Canada. So one of the top destinations was Quebec because the majority of those arrivals were crossing um, along the land, uh, sort of at the unauthorized land border crossing, the Roxham Road from upstate New York to Quebec. And Quebec actually ended up receiving some 90% of those arrivals. Some of those individuals then moved to Ontario. And sorry, can we move back to the previous slide? Because that's a part of the context. So we have seen that different provinces, particularly Ontario and Quebec, have actually been complaining that they're facing these unprecedented arrivals. And of course, they have to spend money on housing, on legal aid, and, they definitely, and they're not receiving sufficient support from the federal government. We have seen major housing issues to the point that uh, sometimes for a period of time, at least in Quebec, there had to be a stadium open just to house those cross-border arrivals. And the fact that they were arriving irregularly, and this is the term that the Canadian government has been using, uh, obviously was raising concerns in terms of associating them with potential security threats. So as you probably know, there is a Canada yes, safe third country agreement, but it only applies at uh, authorized land border crossings. So if somebody is coming from the US, even if they wish to claim asylum in Canada, if they make their claim, make, make their request at the official land border crossing between Canada and the US, they will be turned back to have their case processed in the US. However, if you cross, as many of these cross border arrivals were doing, uh, at unauthorized border crossing, then the agreement does not apply. So for that reason, they were able to come to Canada. They would not be prevented from making a refugee claim in Canada by the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, of course, by now, just as a little side note, uh, the, uh, obviously the agreement for now actually has been effectively extended to apply everywhere across Canada, across the Canada US border. So we have seen because of the pandemic and because of the, some of the changes between sort of Canada and US application of the agreement, we have actually seen those arrivals virtually stop. What, uh, how the Liberal government was reacting to these cross-border arrivals but was in part by developing this particular communication strategy. They have not taken dramatic measures like many other countries at, for example, closing the border or making um, these arrivals ineligible to make a refugee claim. Try, rather, they use these more subtle means of managing the perception of both the Canadian public and of potential refugee claims. Uh, can we just move to the, not to the next slide, but the slide after that? So there were two strands, yes, thank you. Uh, two strands of communication strategies that actually presented quite different messages. One was directed at the domestic audience, and we have seen that there was a lot of parliamentary debate on the issue, including, of course, the one that was subsequently reported in the media. And the IRCC, this is the Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, has even created a special web page that was providing information to the public on cross-border arrivals, including, for example, there was a quiz on what do you know about asylum claimants, how to dispel different myths, and generally speaking, that discourse that was directed at the domestic audience, at least uh, for the first sight, suggests that it is more projecting a more humanitarian message. And can we move to the next slide? I just have a couple of examples of, uh, so this is one of those quizzes that exists on the IRCC website to sort of test a person's knowledge of a island claim. Supposedly again, dispelling myths that they're dangerous or that they jump in the queue. So uh, some of these suggest that they try to create a more positive image of these cross-border arrivals. And specifically the immigration minister at the time was also emphasizing that it is inappropriate to call these arrivals illegal. So the official terminology that was adopted was irregular. They also emphasized that Canada has international obligations. So this is why we cannot stop accepting these arrivals and we cannot withdraw from the Safe Food Country Agreement. Of course, when you start digging a little bit deeper into this discourse, you find out that, of course, it's not all that positive. So, for example, even the answer to question two here, it doesn't actually say asylum claimants are not dangerous. It just says we screen them well. 
So, uh, but at the same time, there was still a veneer of that discourse to the domestic public that uh, we have international obligations, that these claimants are not dangerous, that security is not jeopardized, and we will prepare to deal with them. And those who are not eligible and not deserving of protection will be sort of quickly dealt with and removed. The second strand of discourse was directed at refugee claimants themselves. And this was something that is relatively new, especially in terms of the campaign that the IRCC has started. So uh, there were several initiatives that they have launched directed at prospective asylum seekers. Uh, first of all, they had this Twitter post, and I just have four examples, but there were more of those that were posted at least several times, retweeted several times a month on the IRCC website with these messages. Um, this is something that Canada has not done before in terms of that type of perception management of prospective asylum seekers. Another very interesting and then I would say sort of novel, at least in Canadian context, initiative was to send uh, some of our parliamentarians to the U.S. to connect with local communities, specifically Haitians and some uh, South American, Central American communities that potentially might also be uh, the places of origin of uh, cross-border arrivals. And the main messages were essentially don't come. Uh, if you again read even the Twitter post, there is this idea that uh, it seems the better way to come to Canada is not to claim refugee status, but perhaps to consider economic immigration, that the fact that you come does not mean that you qualify, that if you decide to move, you actually might lose everything. So even if you had, for example, still some status in the US or some options, then you should pursue those. Don't come to Canada. And many of these messages definitely are much more negative than what we see in the domestic discourse. In large part, they really suggest that these cross-border arrivals are very suspicious, that they don't have a very good reason to move here. They're perhaps trying to use the system or use an improper channel, such as a refugee protection route, as opposed to, for example, economic immigration. And since I know I'm almost out of time, so I will just mention two things to connect it to previous presentations. So for example, here, these messages are especially directed at prospective asylum seekers. We definitely see that there is this generalization that everybody, despite the fact that we have actually seen individuals from some uh, 120 countries, including Syria, those that obviously have very well-founded refugee claims, they just happen to arrive in the US first, that all of them are said, well, refugee route is perhaps not the best option. So either consider staying in the US or maybe seek, uh, there were a lot of messages, seek other legal, particular sort of through the economic class or temporary admission as a worker opportunities, which of course very much generalizes the very reasons why people are moving in the first place. And uh, in fact, the government has never conducted any studies into why we have seen this increase in arrivals from the US in the first place. What was there in addition to, for example, the Trump administration? Uh, what were the different reasons based on the country of origin? Because they definitely clearly had very sort of different circumstances. To this date, we don't really know. Yet the campaign presumed that there was one approach for all asylum seekers that should be taken. Um, in relation to the discourse directed uh, at the domestic audience, even though there was this veneer of humanitarianism, some mention of international obligations, they existed only in parliamentary debates. There would be relatively frequent references to, human, or to international obligations. But when we see, uh, for example, different websites so that information about asylum seekers pr provided to the general public, the question of international obligations disappears. So in none of those quizzes or other clarifications about asylum seekers, international obligations are never mentioned. So this is a bit, again, similar to what we've heard from Kate, um, is about this disappearing discourse on international human rights. That really, to the public, it was more they're not that dangerous or we screen them very well. So that's why you don't have to worry, but not so much that we have international obligations. And many of these people uh, have very good reasons why they may seek to enter Canada. And I think I'll stop here so that we actually, because we still have another speaker and so that we have some time for, um, for further discussion. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, just before we head into the Q&A portion, um, and thank you to those who have put your questions up, please feel free to continue asking your questions now, and we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, but I would like to first invite Rachel to um, share a few reflections uh, from her own experience. 
Hey, hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for inviting me to this incredible session. My reflection will be based mainly on the reasons for refugee migration and also why it's important to have refugees tell their stories. To begin with, would you mind going to the fourth slide, please? Yeah, so I'll look at the poem entitled Home by Wasan Shire. She's a Somali refugee. She's a Somali British writer and poet who uses poetry to explain stories of escape and journeys that refugees undertake. And in this particular poem, she's looking at how she's looking at how someone migrates by escaping violence and loses their home. Next slide, please. And if you want the story, the link is there. It can be pasted on the chat so that you can go and read the entire story. And I'll only focus on two stanzas, the first stanza, and it reads, sorry, I'm not good in reciting poems, so I'll just read over it. And the first stanza says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. And the first three lines of the fourth stanza say that you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Next slide, please. So why am I using this poem? This poem relates well with the discussion we've had today in terms of what are some of the reasons that lead refugees to leave their home countries in pursuit of safety and also how it relates to refugee experiences in refugee camps or in their host countries. Would you mind going to the key themes? Yeah. So the key themes of today's discussion as well as of the poem are that refugees do not leave their homes because they choose to, but they leave home because they believe that home is not safe for them and they need to seek for a safe heaven. And it's important as Muhammad indicated that we have refugees telling their stories so as to inform policies around immigration and also to understand their perspective and erase the negative narratives that's usually displayed by the mainstream media. And if you don't mind going to the conclusion slide. And in conclusion, without proper policies in place, the refugees and asylum seekers conditions might worsen in their current country or in the host country. So it's therefore important and it's our collective responsibility to create conducive environment for refugees and asylum seekers so that they get to share their stories and we listen to them as we look at ways, at possible ways of responding to the issues of refugees. And before my closing remarks, I would like to tell you a small kind of story. Like there are some things that refugees experience in their host countries, for instance, police brutality. And it's a problem that most immigrants, refugees or asylum seekers usually face. We recently had the issue of George Floyd and that's not the only problem that people face in the host country. We have so many instances whereby the refugees or asylum seekers end up living a life that that's kind of harder compared to what they left home. And that's not why they leave their home. They live in order to seek refuge in a safer place. But if they end up facing the same challenges that they escaped from, then we are failing as a society. And lastly, 
In the spirit of this year's World Refugee Day theme, let's all stand with the refugees because together we heal, learn and shine and access to healthcare and medical support saves lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I would invite all of our participants, our panelists to um, turn their videos on um, and we will take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so uh, there are a couple of questions already um, and just a reminder, if you'd like to ask the question yourself to put MIC or MIC next to your question, um, and to continue to do so throughout this discussion. Um, but to get started with a couple of questions that are here already, I think um, this first one touches well on uh, what you just mentioned, Rachel, um, around um, kind of the experience in uh, arriving to uh, a destination and, and kind of encountering um, a number of uh, different challenges and uh, really just the, the perseverance that is required to, to continue along uh, a very difficult journey um, that, uh, you know, does not stop once you uh, arrive uh, in a new country or a new place. Um, and so this is from Jennifer, who um, asks, um, and, and I guess kind of related to um, Kate's presentation as well about the um, focus on health discourses in Australia, but this really specific physical health um, uh, discourse. And so kind of between these two places, um, there's a question about um, the, the mental health support for um, refugees and former refugees. Um, and uh, Jennifer is asking um, kind of what can be done for uh, both the organizations that are involved in this work to help eliminate some of those challenges for um, uh, mental health and also the role of governments in um, being accountable for a system that's not offering that holistic support. Um, so I'm wondering if, if anyone um, would like to start uh, with any reflections on that question from Jennifer. It's a big one, I know. <laughs> okay, I would take it. Um... I'm just still uh, reflecting on what Rachel said, you know, because ah, it's a terrible life. It's a painful experience. And for me, it's been almost 30 years since I was exposed to the civil war in Liberia. But, you know, listening to Rachel again, I just feel re-traumatized and because those things never go away. And, um, yeah, it just really makes me emotional all the time. And it's hard to control those emotions, no matter how many years it takes um, with these experiences, which is why <sighs> Jennifer, is it Jennifer? Question is, or Jennifer, question is very important. Um, when I did my master's in public health at the University of Nottingham, I focus on um, psychological interventions for African refugees. And part of the reason I focus on that comes to Jennifer's question as well. Um, WUSC is a great organization, but um, I don't think we have really taken into focus the mental health of refugees from WUSC. And, Countries are accountable, they're responsible, and yeah, they have their role to play. But as an agency that um, bring us to Canada, there needs to be a stronger focus on refugee mental health. And what I remember, you know, listening to Rachel and reading Jennifer's question is, um, when we entered Canada in 2001, I still remember us being told you know, you get sponsorship for one year, but you're a Leonard immigrant, and you will be treated as any other Canadian. Really? I just spent nine years living as a refugee and experienced all kinds of violence, including sexual and physical violence. 
and I enter Canada for the first time and I'm supposed to be like any other Canadian because I'm a Lena immigrant. And our student refugee sponsorship program is fantastic. It's amazing. Oh, cool, Grish. I mean, good for Andrea Wenham who took us over and literally Andrea took care of me and Kadea at UBC. But Andrea is a student and most of the SRPs are students and they don't necessarily have the lived experience. They don't necessarily have the expertise to be more than the support that it gave us as students. They need to study, they need to get their own things going. And Glenn is great. Everybody from UBC knows that Glenn is our father at UBC. He looks after us, literally takes us by the hand, take us to hospital, do several things for us. But at the same time, you know, these experiences that Rachel highlighted, they're, they're life-changing experiences that require a longer time. I was just telling my husband yesterday that when we get back to Canada, um, I'm going to go in for counseling because I still have so much trauma that I have to deal with the fact that I can still cry when I think about certain instances. I need to go for counseling and, 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 and mental health programs the rest of my life because you never get over this thing. So I don't know the solution to Jennifer's question, but yeah, that's my response. Thank you so much, Veronica, for sharing that. Um, you know, I think that the, the role of the public discourse can also really help or hinder that process. And so um, I really appreciate the research that's been done in looking at the messages that are, that are out there um, in the Australian context, in the Canadian context. Um, as really uh, an important to recognize because these are sites where obviously, as you've shared today, there is a lot of room for improvement and um, kind of helping to um, create those more welcoming and, and inclusive societies um, to support the mental health. But um, I agree that definitely with um, more focused interventions at the level of an organization like WUSC, um, I, there's lots of examples of the work of certain local committees or school administrations that's being done um, that are serving as really good models. So I definitely encourage anyone else also who has suggestions on this because it is such a big and important question um, to share them in the chat box and, and share any uh, resources or suggestions that you might have uh, with others. Um, if anyone else would like to weigh in on this question, um, please go ahead and do so. We do have a, a second question that I think is um, perhaps uh, more for Sasha um, about the um, change in uh, US administration um, since, your, since your work and um, whether um, you know, you've explored the, the impact of that um, in the uh, Canada US border crossings. I think Rachel has her hand up, so maybe Oh, thank you. Sorry, Rachel, I missed that. Yes, sure. Thank you so much. It's okay, thank you. So to the first question, as a student who's still in school and someone who came through WUS, I would like to add that it would be important to have WUS students connecting and learning from their shared experiences. We might be from different countries and came from different refugee camps, but our experiences at the end of the day are those of someone who left their home countries in search for a peaceful state. And if we all come together and share our experiences, it's said that a problem shared is a problem solved or half solved. So if there's a way the local communities can organize like a Let's get together, even if it has to be on Zoom. Now that thanks Corona, we can use the social media and the internet to like connect with other people. We don't have to be physically in the same environment for us to connect. So we can have those sessions just to talk and relieve yourself of the stress that you are experiencing. I also don't know like how the other schools operate, but in my school, the WUSC is kind of alienated from the faculty and staff. 
And I think it would be important to have like faculty members as part of the local community so that they can help in weighing in on important issues like mental health and also to support students where possible. And by so doing, we'll have uh, healthier students who, are, who have better mental health status and they can be in a better position to achieve their dreams. Like I know of York University, they usually have faculty staff members as part of the rules committee. And they usually have hold this monthly meeting to check on students and to know like how far everyone is. If you have any problem, you can easily reach out and talk to them. But that's not the case with all schools. So I think WUS can coordinate with the schools and look for a way forward whereby we can have students sharing their experiences and also like having that free space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I know uh, a lot of my WISC colleagues, uh, other local committee members um, are on the uh, on the webinar right now. So I'm sure they're all so appreciative of some of this really direct feedback. Uh, it's so helpful. Rachel, as you were talking as well, I was thinking about Mohammed, your presentation around just the empowerment that comes with being able to tell your own story. And so I think that um, that is such an important theme, um, something that I was thinking about in hearing uh, the presentations today was kind of that disconnect between the, the decision makers around the discourse that is presented at the government level and the this thriving and uh, critical discourse happening at the individual level um, and how um, these two spaces can better uh, come together to create a more holistic discourse. Um, but Mohammed, I see you've uh, also raised your hand. Thank you for using that function. That's very helpful for me. <laughs> so I, I will We'll pass it over to you to say a few words as well. Yeah, thanks. So uh, it's kind of in hearing um, Veronica talk and Rachel talk, and it, it kind of brought me back a little bit to my field research where, you know, the, the issue of mental health, um, you know, there, and I, I'm talking in the European context because that's, that's my field. So it, it, whenever I brought up that issue where, you know, how does, how does one cope? what are the coping mechanisms you know there's there's physical health there's mental health um just a story quickly uh the first interview that i conducted um i'll never forget this it was in copenhagen denmark and you know i was so nervous talking to this individual who was part of an organization um, where they were providing refugee care and so I sat down with her and five minutes into the conversation, she just completely broke down, completely, completely. And so for me, that was such a big shock, even though I had prepared myself mentally to anticipate any of these responses, I didn't know how to, to respond. I didn't know what to do. I didn't, you know, and I, I kind of just stood there in silence and, and I was thinking to myself, what do I do? And so I gave her the opportunity to kind of let it all out. And, and I'll never forget this. And it's sort of imprinted on my psyche. She finished exerting all of that emotion and then just smiled at me. And I said, are you okay? And she said, sitting here with you, being able to tell you what I went through, I'm okay now. And I was trying to hold myself together because I didn't know, like it was a very surreal experience. And so that's just a very short anecdote of sort of my experience in researching this. Um, you know, in terms of mental health, when asylum seekers in Europe go through the process, when they talk to, you know, immigration authorities, refugee authorities, the story and the why is never taken into account, which has such a detrimental effect on you know, an individual's ability to identify who they are and why they are in the situation that they are. So that's just one little snippet. And just very, very quickly, you know, a lot of people that I spoke to, their main focus is survival. So their main focus is finding an actual place to stay, a roof over their head, finding, you know, some kind of, you know, opportunity to make 
you know, a little bit of money or, or, or garner a little bit of, you know, revenue to, to support their family. It's, you know, finding the, the, the wherewithal, they're undocumented to stay away from, you know, authorities trying to, to, to arrest them. Like, there's so much of the physical that we focus on that the mental part of it and the, 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 the toll that it takes is completely neglected. So, I mean, having not experienced that, but listening to others and how they've shared the, the mental part of what it means to be a refugee is is fascinating on so many levels, but just it, we need more care on that. And it's just, that comes from top down. It comes, you know, at the macro level where, you know, governments have to do a better job of that. But that was just my contribution. Um, and I will just sort of say two things to address the previous point on mental health. Again, I have never gone through the experience, the refugee experience. So once again, you know, who am I to really say what should be done? I think what's very important is to have more direct voices of refugees because there's still not enough. And uh, especially, and again, especially for the um, for refugees themselves to actually enter the academic field to speak directly is incredibly hard. But I think what's probably support at least, you know, to a certain extent of that solution to give these direct voices, because I think even when we conduct interviews with refugees, and then that becomes a part of, for example, again, academic or other publications, it is still mediated through somebody else, right, who has not gone through that experience. So I think a direct voice is the most important one, and it's still missing, um, I think, largely, especially at the policy level, I, like, I don't think there is ever enough effort to actually include refugees themselves into uh, the discussions of what should be done. And on the second point, sort of related to what Mohammed was saying, um, the big issue, especially, for example, in the refugee determination process, whether it's in Canada, I think elsewhere, is uh, that uh, the claimant is asked just tell this story, but it's not for the purpose of really understanding the experience, it's just whether you fit the definition. And the very refugee hearing, for example, before the board here in Canada, is largely this fragmented sort of picture of concentrating on uh, what are the problematic parts of the story, where the details are missing, and where we're not sure that you fit the definition, or where we need more elaboration, but it's never really, so the hearing itself is not set up that the claimant sits there and just tells this story as is. It's really a question answer period, and the point truly is, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say entirely mechanical, but it's really just to see whether you fit the criteria or not. It's not a part of some sort of experience of healing, for example. If anything, it it could be more traumatizing than anything else. Um, and I think there is also a big issue in terms of how lawyers uh, prepare for a refugee hearing, because inevitably, unfortunately, especially those who do a really good job, they have to ask uh, claimants multiple questions in preparation for the hearing, including the very tough ones that likely the board, and sometimes I would say probably insensitive ones, that the board members may ask them as, as well. So the biggest question, and this is, I, I don't really have an answer to that, is how to, uh, how for lawyers to uh, be better tuned to situations of claimants, but also find that balance where they can prepare them well enough for the hearing, including for those tough questions, but at the same time, without re-traumatizing them. And I don't, I don't know if there is a solution there, but I think there is definitely a room for more and, uh, education for lawyers in general, for decision makers in terms of psychological impacts. And sorry, I know we're almost out of time. So I probably will just say very quickly, I think there are two comments um, sort of that relate to much of the legal side. So with the change in the Yes administration, again, um, I, you know, I'm not necessarily full up to speed in terms of major changes. Of course, there is, you know, rhetorically, there is a change and some policies have already been canceled of those compared to the previous administration. I don't know, though, if that's enough to consider the U.S. safe. I mean, officially it is. So, so the agreement is still in place. It's for now, it really uh, applies differently because of the pandemic. So, but once the situation is back to, so to speak, normal, we likely will go back to the way it functioned in the past. Uh, because, but, uh, you know, even though legally we consider the U.S. a safe country, I don't think that the change in the U.S. administration, at least what I've seen so far, 
answers some of the major issues that were brought up, for example, in the most recent, recent litigation, such as detention of asylum seekers. I have not necessarily seen any change in that. Um, or, for example, a different approach to adjudication of certain claims, for example, gender-based ones are from certain countries where the claimants potentially have a lower chance of getting protection in the US versus Canada. So unless there is a fundamental change in those areas, I don't. I think the arguments of the advocates who challenge the safe third country agreement in Canada still remain valid. And maybe if I may, in one minute, sort of the last question. So the fact that yes, many Western states indeed they reinterpret the refugee convention or do not apply it in the way how it's intended to. So interpret it and apply it contrary I think, to the spirit of the convention. Is there a way to hold them accountable? Well, not exactly. I think the only perhaps accountability can come more from, from public pressure, at least legally, there are not no major mechanisms at the international level, at least the ones that we could use effectively. So it's really, I think, perhaps the best is public pressure, including particularly from the domestic public. Uh, so I don't necessarily have perhaps a better answer at this point. Thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you everyone for, for your wonderful and important presentations today. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees for joining in on the conversation, um, joining us today and for sharing your questions. Um, we are at time, so we will wrap it up here as much as I would love to just continue on. Um, if you would like to purchase the book and after today, how could you not? please visit the link that we will share in the chat um, or speak with your local bookstore. Um, as a reminder, we also do have an Instagram contest right now where uh, you can enter to win a copy of your own. Um, if you would like to connect with today's panelists, um, do check out our website for their full bios and visit their um, pages with their academic institutions to see more of all the wonderful research um, that this group is doing. Um, and lastly, we invite you to join WISC throughout the rest of the month of June for more activities on World Refugee Day, which is on June 20th. Um, be sure to follow us on social media for more information and join the conversation online with hashtag WRD2021 and hashtag World Refugee Day. Thank you everyone so much and goodbye.